It's birthday cake time again, and no matter how old you are, everyone deserves a brilliant birthday cake. Hello and welcome to my channel, and welcome to my kitchen. If you didn't already know, Liz is me and you can call me Liz. And each week I've been teaching you a different key kitchen element. Today we're going to throw a few of those together and make my signature chocolate mud cake. For a full list of ingredients and measurements, check out the description. And to start with, we're going to prepare our cocoa. On a low heat, melt the butter and then add your cocoa powder. Let it simmer for about a minute and this will help to open up the flavour of the cocoa. You may have heard this called letting the cocoa bloom. Give the whole thing a mix and be careful not to burn your butter. This will actually be a birthday cake for a friend of mine, so I've increased my measurements to accommodate the size of the cake I'm making. Turn off the heat and it's time to add some dark chocolate. Any good quality dark chocolate will do. Do this while the heat is turned off so you don't burn the chocolate. And you can give the whole thing a stir until everything's melted. Anyone who knows me knows that I absolutely love chocolate. And this is the kind of birthday cake I make for myself. Don't forget to scrape the bottom and the edges to make sure you don't miss anything. Once the chocolate is melted, make sure you continue mixing until the cocoa and the chocolate are completely blended together and you'll end up with a smooth and glossy cocoa sauce. Once it's ready, you can transfer it to a heat-proof bowl and set it aside later. You can also use this as a dessert sauce if you swap out the dark chocolate for a milk chocolate or semi-sweet chocolate. And there's no need to put this in the fridge because we're only going to use it in a few minutes. And while that cools, we need to prepare our dry ingredients. In a separate bowl, add your flour, half your brown sugar, and half of your caster sugar. There's no need to sift the flour because mixing it like this is going to take out any lumps anyway. Stir it all together until all the sugar is combined. Remember to scrape the edges so you don't miss anything. And using the spatula, I'm pushing more than I'm stirring to make sure that I'm breaking up all those clumps of brown sugar. And when you can see that it's all combined, you can pop it aside. Don't forget some housekeeping. And next, the eggs. For the best results, you want to use fresh eggs and use them at room temperature. Using a separate bowl, crack and add the eggs one at a time. This allows you to check each of them separately and you're less likely to get eggshell lost in your mix. If you do get a little bit of eggshell in there, put a little bit of water on a clean fingertip, put pressure on the side of the eggshell and drag it up the side of the bowl. Anytime I'm increasing a recipe, I use eggs as the key ratio point because it's easier to add half a cup of something else than it is to add half an egg. Next, we're going to add our salt and our vanilla. The vanilla adds an extra layer of flavor and fragrance to the chocolate. And we want to mix it for a few seconds on a low speed to break up those eggs and then turn the speed up to high for a few minutes. We almost want to meringue the egg because this will bring added air and structure to the cake. This type of cake is kind of hybrid between mud cake and a sponge. So it has the stability to withstand layers for a taller, stronger cake, but it also retains the softness, moisture and richness of a mud cake. When the eggs become fluffy, take it down to a low speed and gradually add your remaining sugar. If you haven't seen it already, don't forget to go check out part 5 of my Back to Basics Kitchen Guide where I show you how to make the perfect meringue. Adding the sugar slowly allows it to blend more evenly. Before adding the brown sugar, don't forget to check it for lumps. Anytime I'm baking with brown sugar, I opt for the dark brown sugar because it tends to have less lumps and it's got a stronger flavour to it. And for me, this is actually one of my secret ingredients for my gingerbread cookies. Once all your sugar is added, give it another minute or two on low, just to allow that sugar to dissolve a bit. Give the bowl a quick scrape down to make sure you haven't missed anything, and you can also check that the sugar is dissolved. You'll notice that the brown sugar has given the egg a slight tan. If you're enjoying the video so far, give me a thumbs up and let me know. 
and it's now time to add our chocolate sauce. By now it should be nice and cool, but if it still feels too warm, pop it in the fridge for a few minutes. Start it on low until the chocolate is combined, and then you can turn the power up to high. What you'll end up with is a very moussey and light mixture. Continue whipping for another 3 or 4 minutes and then you can turn it off. Your mixture will now have a more milk chocolate look and a silky texture. But it should still have most of that air. And next we're going to come back to the dry ingredients. We're going to turn the flour into a kind of paste. So add half of your milk and all of your oil and stir. This will help to coat the flour to minimize gluten production and to keep it soft. Steadily add your remaining milk and I like to use my dough whisk to help me make sure everything is combined evenly. Overworking your flour is one of the main things that might have a negative impact on the texture of your cake. Swap over to a nice wooden spoon and we're just going to fold everything in, scraping from the sides and flipping it over the top. Learning how to fold a batter correctly can be a massive game changer. This should only take about 30 seconds and your batter should be smooth but thick. Next, add part of your batter to your egg mixture and fold it in. By folding them together this way, you will retain most of the air that we put into the eggs when mixing. And that air is part of what gives the cake its overall structure. As you can see, I turn my bowl while I'm folding, bringing the mixture in from the outer edges for a more even blend. Scraping your tools and bowl will also make sure you don't miss any of the ingredients. Then you can add your remaining batter and continue to fold until it is all an even colour and texture. If you're enjoying the video so far and you're not yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and don't forget to check out some of my other amazing videos. For different styles of cake, the batter will look and feel different. And for this one, it should look and feel like chocolate pudding. Scrape down the sides and using a paddle attachment, give it one last slow mix, only about 20 seconds or so. This is a great way to make sure the overall texture of your batter is consistent throughout. Becoming more familiar with the look and feel of different types of batter is a very helpful skill. You can make your cake any size you want just by simply adjusting the ratios in the recipe. I'm making a four layer cake, so I'm using two large tins. It really doesn't matter how you line your tins, it's only important that you do, but you do it well. This is the method I use because it's the one that I personally find is most effective. And I guess you could say it too is a type of hybrid because I'm using more than one type of method and I'm combining them together for a better result. Here I'm dusting with cocoa powder because it's a chocolate cake, but for a vanilla cake or a plain cake I would use cornstarch. I used to do this on the sides as well, but recently I've been doing this method instead. By brushing the sides of the tin with cake batter, the cake rises more evenly on the sides, but it doesn't stick to the sides. It also doesn't get that slightly overcooked, crunchy feeling that you get when you use butter. Only fill your tins halfway to allow them space to rise. And spread it out smoothly, being careful to get it into the cracks and crevices down in the bottom corners. Because the outer edges of the cake will finish cooking and rise faster than the centre of the cake. I usually swoop from the centre outwards so it's slightly indented in the centre. Once it looks good, give the tin a quick tap on the bench to release some air bubbles. I'm going to put these in the oven at 150 degrees Celsius for one hour. By having a slightly lower temperature and a higher cooking time, you allow the cake to cook a little bit more evenly in the centre. I do this every time I make a layer cake and I want the top to be more flat. You'll know it's ready to come out when you can poke the center with a knife or a skewer and it comes out clean. You can cover this and decorate it any way you want, but tune in next time to see how I did it. 
So thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave me a thumbs up. Tell me your thoughts and comments down the bottom. And I look forward to seeing you back in the kitchen next week. <laughs>